Well, hi there. My name is Perry, and welcome to the Literary Knitterary. <sighs> it kind of feels like a minute since I've done this. Hello. <laughs> My quest for even lighting remains dramatically unsuccessful, and now the sun sets at exactly 5 p.m., so that's just amazing. 2020 has been kicking my butt a little bit. Um, yes, kitty. Cat, cat cameo. I am here today to film an October wrap up and tell you about all of the books that I read in the last month. I read 10 books in October, five of which were plays for a five plays in five days reading vlog, which is the last video that I posted on my channel. And I will link it up above and down below for you. That was my first attempt at a reading vlog. And because the entire video is me sort of reading and talking about those five plays, I am not going to review them here because that I feel would be pretty redundant. So I'll do my best to give you like a two sentence summary and a star rating and if you want any more information you can go to the other video. The average age of books that I read this month was 52 years but the mode released here is either 2019 or 2020. In total I read 1792 pages which of course works out to 179.2 pages per book. Again lots of plays which are pretty short. And on average I read 57.8 pages per day which is not great for me. Um, in fact looking back it seems like I read nine things before October 17th and one thing after October 17th. So make of that what you will. <laughs> but yeah, in terms of page count, this might be the slowest reading month I've had all year. In terms of genre, I read six plays, three of which were classics, one adult historical fiction, one adult romance, one young adult contemporary, and one short story collection with a sort of speculative element to it. And as I just mentioned, one of the 10 things was young adults, so 10% of my reading was targeted towards young adults, the rest towards adults. So yes, lots of plays read this month, a few very old things, some very new things, some things in the middle. And despite the fact that I finished 10 books, which is right about where I want to be, the fact that so many of them were short or plays um, contributed to a lower page count than I normally would like. Not because reading should be competitive or you should be stressed out if you only read 1,792 pages in a month, but just because I am taking that as a signal that I was not doing a good job setting aside time to do the things that I enjoy because I wasn't doing that. But without any further ado, let's review some books maybe. Uh, the first book that I finished in October was Take a Hint, Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is the second book in the Brown Sisters trilogy. So this is about a young academic named Danica Brown who is working furiously to make tenure and doesn't really have time for or a lot of faith in romantic relationships. Um, she's having a little bit of banter with a colleague at work, a security guard who works outside of her building named Zaf, and everything is going more or less swimmingly until one day a routine security drill goes wrong and a photo of Zaf carrying Danica out of the building goes viral on Twitter. And they decide to leverage this moment to drum up some publicity for Zaf's charity, which uses rugby to teach young boys about men's mental health and how to constructively deal with their feelings. So it's a fake dating friends with benefits situation that maybe becomes more? I really liked this. I gave it four stars. I was especially excited for this one because because I knew that Danny, the main character, was bisexual uh, and that this was a male-female romance with a bisexual main character, which is something that I like to look out for. And I thought that was handled really well. It was very normalized, nothing biphobic in the book. Um, and Danny didn't lose her queerness. It was still a part of her identity while she was in a relationship with Zaf. So I thought that was great. This is one of those romance novels that includes romance novels within the book. Zaf likes to read them um, and is not just about this one relationship, but is also about how relationships fit into our lives in general, both in reality and in fiction, if that makes sense. So it's a little meta. Um, and despite the fact that I'm relatively new to the genre, those kinds of romances always work really well for me. The other example being the Bromance Book Club series, which I'm really enjoying. So a lot of the story is about Danny learning what a good and supportive relationship looks like and how it can fit into her life without her having to sacrifice important parts of herself or give up on her dreams. And the moments where she would realize that like Zaf was interested in hearing her talk even though he wasn't himself an academic were just really sweet where he would be like, well no, it's, it's interesting to you so I want to hear about it. And she'd be like, oh, that's never happened before. Um, it was just really cute. I loved that she was a very smart, driven, aspiring academic. So yeah, there's a lot going on here to like. There's explorations of grief and men's mental health. There's the fake dating trope. There's the trope where a person who's historically kind of bad at romance tries to make a grand gesture and then is like, is that right? Am I doing it? Um, which I always think is cute. And the reason that it worked really well for me and I think the reason that it worked better for me than Get a Life Chloe Brown is that there was sort of more, because there was an established relationship in place with established 
established parameters. The two of them were having feelings for each other, but then being like, no, I can't have those kinds of feelings. It's not allowed. Um, and that is sort of what I really, I guess, enjoy about like friends to lovers tropes. So in the broadest sense, this is kind of a variation on that. Um, right? That's why fake dating is fun, is that there's more yearning because you can't just be like, hey, I think I like you because you've already set up a sort of expectation of how the relationship is going to run and you can't be the one to mess that up, can you? So yes, I really connected with the sort of emotional pining in this one because of the obstacles that the sort of fake relationship set up and I thought this was just a really lovely read. We're now entering the five plays in five days segment of the reviews. <laughs> After that I read The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde, which I gave four stars. This is a farce about two couples. The men in each couple pretend to be someone else when it's convenient for them, and that leads to a bunch of mistaken identities and uh, hilarity and shenanigans on the way to essentially a double wedding. After that I read The Wheel Woman by Vincent Delaney. This is about Annie Londonderry, who is kind of the first woman to have bicycled around the globe, but did she really? Or was she a con artist? Or was she an icon for the suffrage movement or what was she? So this play is her story and I gave it 4.5 stars. So next up is Charlotte's Letters by Jennifer O'Grady and this is about Elizabeth Gaskell trying to write her biography of Charlotte Bronte and discovering evidence of Charlotte's love for a married man while she taught at a school in Belgium and it is about love and grief and legacy and I gave it 4.5 stars. After that is In the Next Room or the Vibrator play by Sarah Rule. This is set at the end of the 19th century in America and it follows a doctor who treats uh, female patients who have hysteria by uh, inducing paroxysms in them and it also follows his wife and a few of his patients and the way their lives sort of intersect uh, over the course of a few days. Um, the history on which this one is based may be more myth than well-documented history but it is an exploration of love and how we use the body to express love and I gave it 3.5 stars. And after that I read Lady Windermere's Fan by Oscar Wilde which is about a woman who discovers that her husband has been spending time with a sort of woman of poor reputation. She thinks he's having an affair on her but the truth may be somewhat more complicated and it's a lot about her learning not to view the world in sort of moral absolutes, and I also gave this one 3.5 stars. After that I finished Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado, which I had been reading since like at least August, possibly July. I feel like I've had that out from the library forever because I was trying to do a thing where I would like read a story and then write for like 20 minutes, half an hour, you know, using the short stories to inspire a daily writing practice, and that was very hit or miss in terms of the daily part. But I really, really liked this. Quick warning that the second short story in this collection is about an apocalypse induced by a pandemic, so if that's not your jam right now, that's in there. But yeah, these are feminist short stories that are unabashedly queer and often specifically unabashedly bisexual, and all of them have some sort of a dark, speculative, twist. The first story, which I think is the most famous, is a take on the sort of folk tale of the woman with a, a ribbon around her neck. And throughout the whole collection there's just sort of a lot of ghosts or sort of otherwise unexplained happenstances, a sort of surreal, almost dreamy kind of vibe to it. Obviously some of the short stories are better than others. I personally had a hard time connecting to the really long short story that is a take on um, Law & Order SVU because I had never actually seen an episode of Law & Order SVU, so I wasn't really getting the interactions with the source material, I was just getting what was on the page. But some of those other stories are going to stay with me until the day that I die. There's a line at the end of that first short story, The Husband's Stitch, um, that just broke me. Um, and again, I'm going to be thinking about it forever. There were also weird things happening with this book, like just kind of a really interesting reading experience because again I was trying to write back to it, so I read that whole Law & Order SVU story which has some ghosts in it, and I wrote a little piece of flash fiction right afterwards about a girl who's been in coronavirus quarantine for so long that she like ceases to have a physical body because she hasn't been perceived in so long. Um, and then the next short story in the collection was about women losing their corporeal bodies. Writing back to another one of the stories and along a similar theme, I sort of referenced the like mad woman in the attic kind of idea, and then the final story in the collection also explicitly references the mad woman in the attic idea. And again, I was just sort of like, spooky. <laughs> you know what they say, great minds think alike. But yeah, overall a dark, interesting, thought-provoking collection that really is gonna stay with me for a very long time. I'm thinking about purchasing my own copy and if I didn't say so already I would give it like four stars. 
After that, I was in a quick little informal staged reading of She Stoops to Conquer by Oliver Goldsmith. Um, we didn't do a lot of like rehearsal or prep. It was literally like a cold reading, but online on Zoom for people to come see if they wanted to. And that was a fun little experience, um, a fun way to be exposed to a new play because otherwise I probably wouldn't have read this this year. This is from the late 18th century and is sort of a rare example of a play from the 18th century that we still read and perform and study. A lot of the drama from that time period sort of doesn't work for us anymore, but this one still gets taken out and performed, obviously, because I read it for a performance. This is a comedy set in the house of Mr. and Mrs. Hardcastle. Um, they are about to entertain a visit from a suitor for their daughter, Kate. But on his way to their house, the suitor is waylaid by Kate's half-brother, Tony, who convinces him that the house that he's going to is actually an inn and that he'll make it to the house he's trying to get to the next morning. So he gets there and he starts treating Mr. Hardcastle like the innkeeper. So that's a big misunderstanding. And then the suitor also has the reputation of being really shy and diffident with upper class, respectable ladies, although he's a bit of a flirt with all of the lower class wenches. And in addition to that, um, Mrs. Hardcastle has a ward named Constance and she's trying to get Constance to marry her son, Tony, so that Constance's money stays in the family, but Constance is secretly betrothed to another. And basically it's just sort of a winding road for the two couples to end up happy together, uh, including a moment where Kate dresses up as a barmaid to see how her potential suitor actually will interact with her because she can't get him to actually talk to her when she's dressed as her respectable self and that's where the title of the play comes from she stoops to conquer this is perfectly fine it's entertaining a lot of the lines are genuinely funny i just wouldn't say there's necessarily a lot of depth to it um i don't have any earth-shattering analysis to give you in in this moment again i kind of feel like pure comedies like this do so much better on the stage than they do on the page because if I went to see this, if I watched it, I would be like, what a great evening I've just had. I laughed for two and a half hours. It's pretty long, it's like a five act play. And reading it on the page just isn't quite as much fun. After that, I read The Confessions of Franny Langton by Sarah Collins. This is a historical fiction novel set in the first quarter of the 19th century. And this is the story of Franny Langton, who is currently awaiting trial for the murder of her master and mistress. And it basically tells you the entire story of her life up until that point, um, how she grew up uh, enslaved on a Jamaican plantation, how her mistress there taught her to read, how her master there um, recruited her help in the ethically extremely dubious science experiments that he was doing, um, her passage to England where her master gave her as a gift to this man and his wife, her relationship with that wife, um, and just all of the events leading up to this night where both of them died, but she can't remember anything about what happened. I see some people advertising this book as a mystery or a whodunit, and I really don't think that's a good way to advertise the book at all, because while there is a central murder and a central question of who done it, it's not, the way the plot moves does not resemble a mystery at all. So don't expect that, you will be sad. It is definitely a slower moving, more meditative story because it is literally written out as a confession. I thought the prose was very good. I think it did an excellent job in particular of evoking atmosphere. Like the, the section set in Jamaica felt very hot and sticky. And then as the character transitions to London, the atmosphere shifts and it feels very cold and foggy. And this is also a very complex and thematically layered book. There's conversations about opium use, there's conversations about the way that science or science was used to bolster racism in the 19th century. I think the book has a large focus on intersectionality that some people are not necessarily getting in their reviews. The main character, Franny, is a black woman and there's conversation about how her situation differs from other major characters in the novel who are a white woman and a black man, respectively, because she's at the axis, at the intersection of two different forms of marginalization. So I've seen some reviews saying that the book points out how marriage in the 19th century was a a kind of slavery and how the white woman in the book has it just as bad as Franny and I think that is a fundamental misconstruction um, and I think the part of the point of the book is that this white woman who Franny is in love with believes that she and Franny are in the same situation but they're not remotely in the same situation she is wrong 
Anyway, that's my reading of it. As I just mentioned, Franny has a love affair with her mistress, Marguerite. Um, so this is a book with queer representation as well, and you know that I love queerness in historical fiction. This is also an extremely quotable book. There are many quotes, especially about what reading and writing can do for you, that I would love to write down and, and frame, like, very, very nice quotes. Fundamentally, though, I think the biggest theme in the book is about how we write our stories and who those stories are written for. Franny has been approached several times by white abolitionists asking her to tell her story, but she's not interested in writing a version of her life story that caters to the white gaze, that gives them trauma porn that they can use for their own purposes. Um, she instead is very focused on setting down her own story, the way that she wants to tell it, to present herself the way that she wants to be remembered. So if I'm going to say the book is about something, that's what I would say it's about. Again, it's a very complicated book and I feel like I would have to reread it to feel like I truly understand it, uh, especially with the way that my brain has been lately. Um, but yes, overall, this is a thoughtful and beautiful book and I recommend it. And finally, for the month of October, I read Full Disclosure by Cameron Garrett. This is a YA contemporary. And this is about a teen named Simone who was at a new school after the information that she is HIV positive became public at her old school with negative consequences. So she's at her new school and she is student directing a production of Rent. And she's also kind of crushing on this guy who maybe might like her back. And everything's going pretty great until she receives a threatening note in her locker from an anonymous person telling her to stop hanging out with the boy that she likes or that person will make her HIV status public information and basically out her to the school which she worries will ruin her life like it did the last time. I think the fact that this book exists is great and I think it will be great at helping to dispel the myths and stigma around HIV for teens and I also really enjoyed it as someone who's not a teen. There's also some thematic exploration of queerness and bisexuality. Um, Simone is in a family and friend group that is largely queer and she thinks she might be bisexual but she's not sure if she's like bisexual enough to claim the label and she's not sure how to come out to these people and she's worried that they're not going to take her seriously because all of them are queer and she's again worried about being queer enough. I think that's also really good and useful representation. And I also just really love books about people doing theater. Um, all of the musical references were delightful. But yeah, this was just a really sweet story of her learning to accept support from the people around her and opening herself up a little more and gaining the confidence to go after her dreams. I would give it also four stars. I would recommend this one as well. Okay, and those were all of the books that I read in October. Um, if you want more comprehensive reviews of those five plays, you can head on over to my five plays in five days video. Let me know in the comments down below. Honestly, whatever you want. Let me know how you're holding up. Let me know what you're reading. Let me know what you read in October. I hope you're doing good. I hope you're taking care of yourself. Um, and I hope that if you liked this video, you will consider subscribing and I will see you again soon. But in the meantime, I hope that everyone is staying happy, healthy, and safe. And I hope that somewhere out there, there is a great book waiting just for you. Bye.